Welcome to episode number two of season two. Um, today we are talking with Caleb Earl about his life and all his secrets and things my like that. Secrets. Oh my gosh. I'm just kidding. I didn't know we were going that deep. No, but we're going to talk through some of Caleb's background, um, kind of to segue into well next week we'll or not next week week after next uh, we'll have an episode with me doing the same thing sharing all my secrets and things like that and talking about our lives but we're using kind of our stories as a way to segue into the perspectives that we hold in regards to christianity and how a lot of other people may hold these similar perspectives or you may have very vastly different perspectives than we do but we just want to present that so that you can kind of understand where we're coming from and how we have gotten to the place where we're at spiritually and um i guess where we're trying to go i don't i don't know if we really know where that is but we're yeah we're just trying to give you a, a perspective of who we are and so since y'all have heard me talk a lot the last like 20 plus episodes we're gonna let caleb talk some today and i'm just gonna i'm gonna chat with him and ask him some questions about his life so caleb welcome to episode number two where you get to reveal your life Oh, goodness. It's yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to just be a part of this and help people, you know, for sure. I know we're yeah. forward like I'm doing, you know, yeah, we're together. Yeah, that's that's what this is. If you're a listener, you are on this journey with us. And so welcome to the ride. So, Caleb, we want to know who are you? All right. Who are you? Where are you at right now in life? What does your life look like? Is it calm exciting wild is it in a vacation destination Gordon. it is it is all of those things really um well i'm right now my wife eva and i live in northern italy and we are on staff with a organization a gap year organization um that we host gap year students after they finished high school before they're going to university for a year of ministry, of learning a language, of plugging into the local church. Um, and so we are responsible for the day-to-day -day life and discipleship of these students, uh, mentorship of these students. Uh, and we are so excited about that. We love it. Uh, we really feel like we're supposed to be here uh, in Italy. I've been coming here for a long time uh, in the summers, working with a summer camp here. And uh, it's just been a, a wonderful crazy uh, journey though of uh, finally being here full time. Uh, we got married last year at the beginning of the year in January and then four months later we started the visa process to move here full time and uh, we had visas within two weeks which is crazy that never it never happens that quickly. Uh, we were able to arrive here with an apartment right next door to some of our good friends. It was fully furnished um so really it was a it was just a, a miracle it was a great process um <clears throat> of, of arriving you know everything was provided for and um so right now we're just taking this year first year of marriage to settle in sharpen our language skills make friendships and stuff before we have um our first group of students hopefully this fall Nice. So. That's awesome. So this is a question on the spot. What is like, so, you know, people hear that you live in Italy and there's probably already like certain assumptions about that. What is something that people in America or maybe people outside of Italy assume about Italy? That's not true. Yeah. So, um, I have been accused throughout the years of, um, coming on to live in Italy and live an extravagant lifestyle um, and, and not really be in ministry, you know, uh, because it's Italy and it's beautiful. Um, but what a lot of people don't know about Italy uh, is that it's really moving more and more. And you see this in America too. It's really moving more and more and more away from religion in general, just or not, taking Christianity out, out of the conversation just religion in general um a lot of people just assume that the whole country is super strong catholic and that is true there are catholic parts of the culture um but i would say that catholicism culturally here in italy is much different as well than it is in the u.s so that's a hard thing for people to grasp as they hear okay well it's italy and the pope is there vatican's there you know it's catholic 
why are you there? You know, but in reality, a lot of people are just done. Like in where I mean, like it's growing in America too. Like people are done with it. They're sick of of rules. They're sick of these traditions and um, just Christianity in general. <clears throat> and I think that's a shame. I think that we really can find a way forward with Christianity, which is what this whole season is about, is moving forward in some way. Um, and so that's what we we really want to do. Not a, not even just with our friends and stuff here, but with these students. You know, we want to we want to help anyone that we come in contact with that wants to move forward in following Jesus. That's what we're about. You know. Yeah, I think that's a very very true. Like like I think that <clears throat> people are just not really. I think in the past it's just kind of been like the what's the word I'm looking for like in the past it's been kind of like home field advantage for the church or whatever where like you kind of like already assume everyone around you is is religious or or christian or is involved in some form of tradition and whereas now it does seem like and this is obvious in america but i didn't realize this about i knew about like certain parts of europe that it was like that but it almost seems as though like you can't just assume that people have any form of religion and they're much more willing to just not be a part of any form of religious tradition yeah. um, at all. So that's really kind of an interesting thing. But yeah, I remember you, you talking about that where people have like these assumed ideas about what it means to be living in Italy. The oh, yeah. assumption that I had is that um, American Italian food is like what people in Italy eat, which is not true at all. No. Either. So no, no, eat a lot healthier no. than American. Yes. Food, but uh, fettuccine Alfredo is not a thing and <laughs> you will not find it here. Um, <laughs> pineapple on pizza. Don't even try. There are videos that I've seen of people. There was this pizzeria in Sicily that pranked people one night where the people would call in their pizzas and the pizzeria would show up and give them pizzas with pineapple on them. And there are videos of people like throwing it back at them, chasing them down the street. Like it's, I mean, it, there are some people that you will find here that, that do, but they are very much looked at as what? Outcast. You're, you're not Italian. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, real briefly, what was it like, you know, during the, with the pandemic and everything being in another country and like trying to get there? I mean, I know like for a little while you had to come back to America yeah. and then you went back. And then you mentioned the stuff of visa. So what was that like? Yeah. Yeah. So I was already on staff with our organization, but I didn't have a visa to stay in Italy long term. Uh, this is when my wife and I were still dating. We were not engaged yet. We hadn't even mentioned marriage at that point, but um, I was moving overseas. We were like, okay, let's try to do long distance, you know? So <clears throat> I come here fall of 2019 with a group of students and because we didn't have visas, we were going to have to leave after three months and be gone for three months before we could come back for three months because the program is, is a total of nine. Yeah. Um, so we were here for three months. And then at the beginning of 2020, we went to Cape Verde, where we had another team of students there. And that was when I was I was still here when I read the first article about there being some new virus spreading in Wuhan. Um, and then we went to Cape Verde, things started spreading, Italy ended up shutting down, we made the decision to not go back to Italy, we were going to stay in Cape Verde until the beginning of June, <clears throat> um, and then about a week after we made the decision to not go back to Italy, our president of our organization made the call to bring everybody back home, and we ended up getting evacuated from Cape Verde on an embassy flight that they had arranged, the American embassy had arranged. Um, and we were the largest groups of American, a group of Americans on the island. Um, and so we were uh, put on the first flight out. Um, and so we came back. It was really unexpected. You know, I, I didn't expect to be back in the U.S. so soon, um, but it, it kind of provided an opportunity for Eva and I to move forward with things. So uh, I ended up proposing. Um, we started planning the wedding, planning to move back here full time, whatever we could. Um, and she was still finishing university working full time. So it was 2020 was really crazy wild um for us. For and you sure. got to like, live live next door to me too for a little bit. Yeah, we lived together. <laughs> yeah, me well, and yeah, Kelly like, 
met through living. So I lived in a room at a, a family's house here where we are from or where we live or I don't, well, Caleb doesn't live here anymore, obviously, but where we were both living at, at the time here in Dalton, um, we stayed at a family's house and we both rented rooms from them. And so that's how we met. Um, and he's been <clears throat> blessed for that. So, yes, yes. <laughs> I think you said last time uh, we talked there's something that we are, we're closer now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now that you're across the apart. ocean. Did we were, yeah. we lived yeah. next it's crazy. to each other. <laughs> So you you know so you're you're in ministry now you're working um, in a faith based organization. What was it like? So obviously you're on this podcast for a reason and you're helping out for a reason. You are you're kind of like maybe having some perspectives that have been shifted. I'd like to hear some of your story of where you kind of came from in your faith and what the background of your faith looked like, um, and what where what led you to the point where you're at now. Um, and kind of when did those shifts begin? But let's just kind of start, I guess, at the beginning of little Caleb's story. Well, Caleb, well, uh, on a on a warm day in the beginning of June. Um, no, my dad was so I grew up in church. Uh, my dad was a pastor for the first five years of my life. Um, he pastored two churches at one time, actually, for a while. Um, and he ended up when I was about five, um, kind of getting getting really burnt out with some of the behind the, the behind the scenes ministry things that you see in in pastoring a small rural faith community in South Georgia. Um, and so he ended up uh, leaving full-time ministry and we moved back to the Atlanta area where I grew up. Um, and so even then though, everyone around us still kind of viewed him as the pastor. He had went to seminary, you know, so he was the one that everyone called to do funerals, weddings, all kind of stuff. You know, he was the one praying at every event uh, that we had as family, you know. Um, so growing up in that kind of household, there was a huge emphasis on church involvement and serving. Um, and so we were really plugged in from the beginning. Um, and so I've really been through though a, a wide mix of evangelical traditions i'll say evangelical because really it's all been under the umbrella of evangelical christianity um but even under that umbrella there's a lot of different expressions of that um <clears throat> and so my grandparents attended a methodist church um my mom loved that it was a uh, smaller and so she really enjoyed the smaller kind of community atmosphere uh, versus the main church that we really considered our home church um, was more of a non-denominational but Southern Baptist kind of thing you know like those churches that they th they're associated with the SBC but they they don't put it anywhere perhaps out of like a, a way of distancing themselves from some of the more uh, expressions of tradition of traditional Christianity that many people have kind of been burnt out on in the past couple decades. Um, so, but it was, you know, it was a typical modern American contemporary mega church kind of thing. Um, so there I got super involved in middle school ministry. Um, and I really, that's where I really became passionate about ministry. Uh, I had a lot of fun. I learned how to, um, you know, teach a message and plan big events and lead small groups. And that's where I, I, I really, you know, recognized my passion for helping people grow spiritually. And it was a really wonderful experience. Even now, like being in the place that I am rethinking so much, I still look back at that as it was a, it was a really good time. And I, I, I really learned a lot about myself and I had a lot of fun. Um, I also was homeschooled. Um, and I was, it was, I was mostly around conservative evangelicals, uh, with some fundamentalists too. We were part of one of those homeschool groups and we were actually considered more of the, like the more liberal heathen kids in the group because we were allowed to watch Disney channel. Oh my um, gosh. yes. I love how you I, were just like, oh yeah, by the way, I was homeschooled <laughs> like, this. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it definitely was, it was a bit of a bubble, which I'm sure I'll talk about here in a bit, but, um, yeah, it was, it was an interesting experience for sure. Um, and so then after high school, 
well, I moved to Chattanooga or well, the Chattanooga area um, because my middle school pastor who I was working for at the church in Atlanta was moving to Chattanooga to start a church with our church planting network as the church likes to call it. Um, and he founded the church as a non-denominational church explicitly. Like he was not associated with the SBC, even though a lot of his doctrine was still the same as the church before, you know, but he wanted to label it non-denominational as a way to also distance themselves from some of the movements within Christianity that, that probably the people that he was trying to reach would not have, that would have been a turnoff. Um, so I was there with them for two years on staff um, and then I moved uh, my attendance to a church in my city where I was attending college because it was closer and that's where most of my friends were. Um, and it was very similar to the church I've been at before, typical non-denom, but Southern Baptist thing. There's actually a lot of different people at that church, um, but I, most people that attend have come from that Southern Baptist yeah. evangelical background. Um and then, so yeah, throughout the rest of the years in college, I also served on leadership with BCM, which is the Baptist Collegiate Ministry, which is a which is under the SBC. Um, but I also was really influenced by Bethel and Jesus Culture. I actually did Bethel's online worship ministry school. I was a worship leader for this college group, um, and so learn leading worship with a Bethel style in a Southern Baptist group was a <laughs> really wild um, experience. That whole definitely, sentence is just hilarious. Yeah, I, I definitely had to be confident in myself. <laughs> oh, you were. <laughs> hey, Caleb's very talented, though. You're a, you're a good, you do, you do well, like playing and singing. So, I mean, like, you know, Thank you. they taught you something. <laughs> Yeah, I did. I, and you know, even that too, while there is a lot of crazy that I've had to, you know, rewire and rethink, I grew so much from some of the things that I learned from teachings at Bethel. Uh, I like, it was when I was listening to some of their talks that I feel like I went through a lot of my, my most deep emotional heat and spiritual healing. Um, like I, I, my life really deeply, I, I changed, you know, in that season of my life for the better. Now, some of the other, you know, it's, you're throwing out the bathwater thing. I, I'm, I'm keeping the good stuff and I'm throwing out this stuff that was like, okay, yeah. I don't need that anymore. Um, but yeah, anyway, so that was, that was really, um, the kind of background that I've had. Now we attend a, a small, very small um, evangelical church here because that's it, really that's the only church yeah. that we have in this whole area here in Italy. Churches are just really hard to come by, um, and so we attend there. And I I, I I really enjoy it. It's very involved and, and uh, participatory. Um, you know, everybody can suggest a song or suggest a, a read a, a verse or. or pray um it's it's very it's very laid back and and we we enjoy it we found a, a good little community here so yeah and i think a lot of people will resonate with your background i think it's just so interesting that like when you look at all the different things that involved within christianity in the united states you really have like a melting pot of just theology and like mm -hmm. viewpoints and um it honestly is whoever has the biggest platform wins in yeah. a way. It's kind of weird. Yeah. I mean, you know, when I think about like, you know, Southern Baptist um, theology, um, it's kind of divided, but there is a very strong pull <laughs> towards reform theology in that. But what's interesting is that you grew up in that, but you also still were influenced by a very, like what many reformed the theologians and things like that would be very opposed to, which is Bethel. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's yeah. a very interesting thing. And I think a lot of people can resonate with that because I mean, what I think the, in, the interesting thing is like what people don't realize a lot of times is how influenced um, the way in which Christianity is viewed in their mind has been by uh, literally whoever has had the biggest platform at the time. Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, I remember reading the book Radical by David Platt. Yeah. 
Yep, me too. I was in, and I'm going to talk about that actually on this next episode we do when I talk. And that had a huge impact on my thinking for a while. And then looking back on it, I realized, well, actually, I don't know if I believe those things anymore. And so anyways, I don't want to get into that, but that's kind of very interesting. I think a lot of people kind of have a similar experience. Like you literally said, I grew up in a Southern Baptist background, but learned to lead worship through Bethel and their resources. So there's they're such a melting pot of different viewpoints on Christianity. Um, so, you know, you said you grew up in that and you had like, there was good and, and negative or whatever. And I think everyone can say they've had good and negative experiences within their spiritual walk for the most part. Um, what kind of gave you, like, what made you feel like you needed to start like shifting some of your perspectives? Like what made you feel like, okay, I'm not sure what I believe. And like, and and you said, like, you made the statement, I don't really need that anymore. What does that kind of mean and look like for you? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, in the last couple of years, probably it really, I really, really started thinking more about this stuff. Even I would say even beginning way back in 2016, when you know who got elected, um, that's when, that's when I, something started to shift in my head. Um, and I start, I started to realize, okay, something's, something's off. Something's not right. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but something I'm, I'm missing something or a lot of other people are missing something. I don't know what it is. So, um, but I'd say over the last maybe two, three years, I've really been learning how to, um, pop my bubble, you know, um, I've, been listening to a lot of people that I wouldn't have listened to before. I've really, that's been a huge part of my faith practice in the last couple of years is to challenge myself and listen to people that I would have thought I would disagree with, or that other people have been like, no, don't listen to them because they're heretics. You know, I've just been like, I actually don't know what I'm talking about in some of this stuff. I'm just regurgitating things that I've heard all my life. And I need to, I need to look at what I believe and really think about why I believe these things and, and go look for myself and figure out what I think, you know? Um, And so it just, it was that it was realizing how much I didn't know about things, how much I didn't know about church history, um, how much I didn't know about theology and how theology develops and how people come to conclusions about their doctrines and, um, you know, what the processes are like for interpretation. And I, I didn't even know a lot about the Bible, you know, I mean, I knew how I, I knew English, so I knew how to read my English Bible, but I didn't, I didn't know how to pay attention to patterns and, um, and repeated word things. Some of the things that we learned from the Bible project, um, I didn't, I didn't know how to really read it with a critical lens. You know, um, I just, I would read it for encouragement. And then as far as doctrine would go, I would just take whatever everybody else was saying, you know, whatever the pastor said from stage, that's what it was. You know, I just didn't think for myself. So I, I think once I realized how much I was actually missing, it started, I feel like I'm having to play catch up you know? And so I've always been a very curious person. I've always wanted to learn and, um, you know, discover new things. So that's, that's really been, what's been driving me. I think in all of this is just, I, I've always been really passionate about Jesus and following him. And I want to, I want to constantly go deeper into what that means. Now, if that shatters the paradigm I had before, that's fine. And I'm okay with that Um, because it's not about what I think. It's about following the risen Christ for me. Um, So that's, yeah, I I think I might've gone a couple different roads there from your question, but that's what started. That's what started this whole thing for me. I think just realizing I, I need to know this stuff for myself. I need to figure out what I even know and, you know, stop just regurgitating stuff.
Yeah, I resonate with that a lot. That's one thing that I, I have, like, that's something I talk about with my mom. So I'm, um, she's older, obviously, but like, I hope she doesn't hear me say that. But anyways, um, but like, <laughs> you know, so like, we'll talk about this and she'll say things along the lines of like, she, she has been listening to a lot of like the Bible project and things like that. And she'll wow, say, awesome. you know, I grew up in church and she was like, I, I'm just now learning some of this stuff. She's like, I just yeah. have been you know, kind I've of never heard the this. same things I always have. That's a shame, you know, it's like sad. Yes. And so I yes. think that's why, I mean, honestly, that's why I, I feel like, you know, we have a heart for what we're doing here is we don't, I don't necessarily, I'm, I'm not going to ever tell someone like, this is what you need to, here you go. This is what you need to believe. Right. But I just want to be like, here's all this and yeah. maybe it can help you. So what were some things, like, what were some like core things maybe in your growing up background that um, you felt like you, like you over a course of time, you kind of realized like, okay, I don't, I'm not with this anymore. Or maybe you can remember where the light came on and you were like, that's not exactly how it happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, what we've seen in the last couple of years is that, and I think I knew this before in some way, but, evangelical Christians in America are really afraid of new ideas that contradict those they've been con like that they've been told their whole life or that um, they're afraid of ideas that they've been conditioned to be afraid of you know um, they, it's like they have this heresy alarm um, where there's like a red flag that goes up because they hear something that they they heard in church or they heard their pastor say they heard their dad say whatever that, um, that's dangerous thought. You know, you don't, don't think like that. Don't ask that question. Don't have that doubt. Um, and so I think a lot of times people interpret that as the Holy spirit convicting them, like don't listen to that or don't, don't read that book. Um, but I think, I, I don't know. I think a lot of times what people are experiencing as, as like a spirit check is actually just their own discomfort with something that is confronting their paradigm, their worldview that they have. Um, and so it's like an emotional survival instinct uh, because this thing that I'm being presented with goes against what I've been finding security in my whole life. And so I need to just automatically reject that and not even think about it. So um, what happens is you kind of have this thing that is, it's like a doctrine test. You know, it, people, people literally approach their faith and studying the Bible as if they're going to, they are going to come to the end of their life and God's going to say, okay, hand in your test. How many answers did you get right? And if you get, if you get a one or two wrong, sorry, you're out, you know, you can't, you can't come in here. Um, and I just, I don't, I'm, I'm I really don't think that's how God works. <laughs> I just, I don't think he's this teacher that's going to be grading a, a test to see how many opinions you have right about the Bible like, or about, about faith or life or whatever, how many political opinions you had, right. That's just bogus. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I started to notice like, okay, wow, we're outcasting people who think differently than us or question people. And I, I don't, I don't think we're supposed to do that. That doesn't seem right to me. So I remember when Gungor, um, came, when Michael Gungor came out about not being a Christian anymore. Uh, I, I just remember people around me were so evil uh, towards him. The, the way that they talked about him, the way that they approached that whole situation, just was, it just did not seem like Jesus to me. And so <clears throat> I was like, why, yeah. this is why, this is why people don't like us. This is why people don't take us seriously because we don't know how to hold our own in a conversation and still be secure in what we think. We have this emotional anger that triggers us when we're approached with something that we don't, that doesn't fit our narrative. Um, so I just started to think that that just didn't seem right to me. So I started to think differently about that. I'm like, okay, what's, what's going on here? I need to listen to this person. I need to really have compassion for what, even though I might not agree with him, I need to understand what's going on in his heart, you know, and come at it from a compassionate place. So, um, yeah. And then the last couple of years of just seeing Christian nationalism poke its nasty head and, um, really the more I've studied 
the Bible and how the Bible is structured, how it works, uh, how it came together, the more I'm seeing, man, biblical illiteracy can just cause so many misunderstandings about Jesus and cause such mistreatment of people. Um, you know, I just read The Making of Biblical Womanhood by Beth Allison Barr. Um, and reading about the history about how the church used this doctrine of complementarianism to manipulate and gain power over women. It's just, it's, it's terrible, you know? So I, I want to look at topics like that, you know, that have been taboo and pick them up apart for myself. You know, I know that, that God's not going to smite me because I'm asking questions. I'm engaging with my faith. I'm engaging with what I believe. And that's what I've always been told to do. You know, it's just that when some people start to do that, people don't like the conclusions they come to and they well, want to try to control this and they want to. Well, it's on keep... your terms. Exactly. And it's You're like, able to do it exactly... on your terms. Yeah. Yeah. I have to be able to personally head this, like take this stuff head on for myself. Yeah. If I'm going to really believe it, you know, if it's just something that I'm repeating that I've heard, it's not really it's not really authentic. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've been reading a lot of books about social justice and American history because a lot of those topics were really censored for me growing up, being homeschooled and growing up in an evangelical church, you know, topics around scientific advancement, yeah, things like that. It's like, I, I don't, I don't know about any of this stuff. I just know what I've been told to say when I'm approached with that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I think that a lot of people will resonate with your experience. I do. And, and I wasn't as like embedded in it because I, I wasn't homeschooled and things like that. And I, so I still had some exposure outside of my eco chamber to like, I remember it was so interesting growing up. I remember like, it was almost this kind of thing where like people would respond with like anger towards people that would leave the faith. But not only that, it would be like, Oh, we pity you kind of thing. Like, Oh, we, we feel so sorry for you. You know, we just, we need yeah. to pray that and, and like pray for your in, heart. In a, You've been so misled. Yeah. And in, in, in a way, I, I understand the sentiment of where they're coming yeah. from, but I just don't think I think it all comes back to like, how do these things come across? And, and like, I don't think that polarizing statements and things like that a lot of times are necessary because oh. the if you make a and, and the thing, the way in which Christians define it is if you if you stand up for truth, you're a strong, firm Christian. Well, yeah, I get some of that. But on my, from my perspective, I look at it as like, if I make this polarizing statement now, how many doors am I closing for what's ahead of me and the yeah. people that I'll meet ahead of me? And another yeah. thing is like, I just feel like it's a shame that like we're having these conversations through a podcast, whereas I think that the church ought to be the ones literally like, I, mean, I think it'd be cool for a church to be like, hey, we're having a unorthodox night. And come in with your questions. Like, I think that <laughs> that's the thing that I think people are kind of longing for. And I think that your story kind of shows that, like, it's easy to be caught up in an eco chamber and mm -hmm. you reproduce the same kind of faith over and over again. Mm -hmm. And like here and when we say and use the word evangelical and things like that, we're not trying to demonize, but there's all, we're, yeah. we're trying to define and give understanding to who and what we're talking about. So if mm -hmm. you're an evangelical person listening to this and you aren't guilty of these things, great. But there are many that that are. Yeah. Uh, and so we're just trying to like use words that are popular and yeah. define things and present things from our own personal experiences. And so our goal here is not to like claim that we have the right answers or things like that. But our hope is that this would give people opportunity that if they're in the, in the fence of questioning and things like that, that they yeah. would be like, OK, I can be open and honest and I can like yeah. not have to necessarily be stuck inside like one box. And uh, so, right. yeah, I just you know, I think your story really does resonate with at least with me. Um, and I know other people because they've had the same kind of similar background. Um, so with like do you have any people maybe like that you've been reading lately or like um you mentioned that one of the ways in which you're practicing your spirituality now is like listening to things you wouldn't have before reading things you wouldn't have before you sent me a podcast the other day by a guy named peter rollins i never heard of him i started listening to him 
really challenging stuff. But who else yeah. have you kind of been like, who are some people you've been listening to or reading? Yeah. <clears throat> so I um, really love Tim Mackey and the guys at the Bible Project. They are uh, just brilliant. You know, they are doing such a great job of teaching the Bible. Um, and I took, I actually took one of their courses on their new classroom, uh, feature on their website, which listeners, y'all have got to check this out. It is incredible. It's they're, they're free, completely free seminary level classes, um, that really go in depth, um, in certain passages, even just like the, the one that I did, I, I'm in the middle of the second course that I'm doing now, but I finished the one on the introduction to the Hebrew Bible. Um, and so in that class, he teaches, he shows you how the Bible came together, uh, how it's structured. You know, he, it was a very basic level introduction to some of the, the tools and skills that you need in reading the Bible. Um, and it was, it just, it was a huge paradigm shift uh, for me. So Tim Mackey's great. Uh, I love Richard Rohr. Um, he does a great job of challenging my brain and also just giving me hope, f- you know, for, uh, for moving forward and, uh, trusting that, um, you know, God really is good and he's, he's present in my life. And, um, so guys like Richard Rohr, uh, James Finley, you know, a lot of the people in the mysticism community, um, I really love listening to them. They, they challenge the way I think a lot. Um, another person is Pete Inns, another Bible scholar that uh, you and I both love. He was on the podcast last season, actually. So you need to go check that out if you never caught that episode. Um, he's really great. He did a book, <clears throat> a couple books that I've read last year, um, one on Genesis, one on Exodus, and then one just generally on the Bible uh, that were really helpful. Um, and then I've also been reading a lot of um, authors of color, um, Mark Charles, who wrote Unsettling Truths, um, really, really eye-opening book about the doctrine of discovery and how that uh, has just harmed millions of people. Um, and, and just, yeah, I mean, it's, I grew up with a certain version of American history, you know, so reading that book was very, very eye-opening for me. Um, and then also, uh, I read, I just finished Shouting in the Fire by Dante Stewart. Uh, it's a memoir that he just came out with, which is really also very good, very eye-opening. And I'm reading right now, um, I'm Still Here by Austin Channing Brown. Um, so I'm just trying to, I'm just, tr- I'm, I'm trying to learn about racism, trying to learn about American history and the versions that, uh, you know, we hear in evangelical circles and what actually happened, you know, um, I know that's super taboo. Um, and then I, you know, I'm just trying to learn about the Bible. Um, yeah. so all, all those people are really, really helpful to me. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, several of those, I, I also find very helpful. Um, yeah, I think that like it's just cool to see like honestly, I don't I don't know how many of those people you were reading and things like that when we first met. Um <laughs> none of them actually. Yeah, and what's really funny about like I don't know if you remember this or not, but like I remember us kind of like it was like I kind of like not literally but like figuratively like cracked the door open to having a conversation of like about doubt and like not really sure what I believe or things like that. And I and the long, for the longest time I just felt like I was at a place, I was working in a church at a place where I felt like everyone around me was so certain. And then like, we started talking and I was like, okay, cool. Like I found someone to talk (laughs) about this with. I'm going crazy. And then like, I remember like, I was like, Hey, you need to read this book and vice versa and whatnot. And so, yeah, I mean, like, I think that if you, if you're listening, I know it can maybe be like discouraging sometimes to feel isolated, but, um, there are people out there. Um, there are people that will have yeah. conversations. And honestly, a lot of times it's the people you least expect to, yes. to be the, the person yes. that's like, oh, yeah, I have those questions. I do all those things. But I think that like, you know, I think all these perspectives, I think God like looks at the the effort and the attempt to yeah. discover who he is. And I think it makes him glad. You know, yeah. I, I feel like it's like, 
I'm not just accepting and regurgitating, but I'm seeking and I'm looking. Yeah. And that I think is what the, the faith journey is. So I want to, so, so with all this kind yeah. of, you know, being said, what is it that for you right now, like, what is it that in the midst of questions, in the midst of doubt, in the midst of like relearning things, what, um, what is it that you are finding kind of hope in as you continue your journey of faith and maybe something you can leave with the listeners today um, with what's helped you and like what you find to be true for you and your following of Jesus? Yeah, well, towards the beginning of a lot of this, um, when I was first introduced to Thomas Merton, uh, who's a Christian mystic, um, he had this quote in his book, Thoughts on Solitude. And he says, my Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I'm doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, will I trust you always, though I seem to be lost in the shadow of death. I will not fear for you are ever with me and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. So the two things in that quote <clears throat> that really opened the door wide open for me was the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Though that just gives me the freedom to explore theology and my faith so much more gracefully, so much more intentionally, without pressure, without anxiety and religious anxiety that I grew up with of, oh my gosh, if I have one wrong opinion, God's going to throw me into the fires of hell. <clears throat> but this has just given me so much more peace in everything I don't know. And just being able to say, you know, I, I don't have the answers on this. What I do know, what I do have is my experience with God. And that is good. I know that God is good. I've had experiences with God that I cannot explain. And I'm, I don't need to prove that to anybody. I don't need to explain it to anybody. I don't need anybody to believe me. But I know that I have experienced this God in my, in my life of following Jesus. I know that I've experienced him. And I have, I'm a completely different person because of that, because of Jesus. And I really truly believe that there is, there is something about him that is so worth following. And I, my, my heart really breaks when I see people just throwing out everything, you know, I, I understand. I do. I really get it. I, I think that people might need to walk away for a little bit, you know, like, People need to be grieving this pain. People are hurt. People are frustrated. People have been abused in our churches and they're really frustrated and their whole world has been brought down. And, and when they think about Jesus or the Jesus that they knew, you know, what comes up for them is trauma. And so I get this. I understand the, the frustration and the anger. Um, <clears throat> But I, I do believe that there's something here and I want to keep pursuing it and I want to help others that want to pursue it. You know, I'm not trying to drag anyone with me. I'm not trying to convince anybody. I don't want to, I, my, my, like we, I, I said earlier, my faith isn't about proving myself anymore. It's about, I have had an experience with this risen Jesus and I want to keep, I, I want to keep following him because I know that it's leading me somewhere good. And I'm okay with that shattering things that I've held before place things that I felt security in before I'm okay with him shattering all of it, you know, because I trust him. Solid dude. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, that quote, um, that you read, like that, honestly, that expresses how 
my mind has been working for a long time in words that I couldn't even explain myself. So I, I, I didn't even know you're going to read that. So that was really helpful for me. Yeah. I just, it just came up. I just yeah, remembered it. That's you know, a great, I, that's a solid quote, but yeah, I, I think that your, your story is, is really helpful. And I'm, I'm really thankful that you're at a place where you're just, you're okay with what this is. Uh, and I think that like, I think that what we forget is that I think more people that there's many, many people that are on this journey there's many people that have been on this journey. There's going to be many people in the future that are, and it's okay. And I, and I just, I appreciate you just sharing kind of being vulnerable with the things that you've, you've grown up in and, and the questions that you've had and, and where you're at now. And I hope that for, for you listeners that um, Caleb's story can be like encouraging for you and present to you, um, you know, someone that is in a, the same place as a lot of you, maybe you grew up in a similar background and um, maybe you're kind of questioning and wondering, you know, I would encourage you if you can, and I know it's not easy, if you can find people to talk to about this, uh, it's really helpful. It's helped me a lot. Um, and, you know, we just hope that what we're doing, it will provide you with some kind of insight and encouragement. Um, you know, never like if, if you want to reach out to us, like literally you can message us on Instagram. We're going to read it. More than likely we'll respond. Um, you know, we, we're, we're just two regular people that are just wanting to be there for others and, and present them some different perspectives to, to towards Jesus and understanding um, who God is and, and what he offers. Uh, and I think that, that, that what he offers is, is a journey that, that is really good. And I yeah. think it's something that you can find hope in by the continual everyday following of Jesus. And that's what, yeah. that's what I have to hold on to in the midst of all my doubts. And so Caleb, yeah. thank you for, for sharing. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's nice to be able to say that, you know, that I still want to follow Jesus because in the last couple of years, especially in the last year, you know, just confronting all the questions that I didn't know I had, you know, there have been moments where I have really been like, uh, I don't, I don't know what I believe in this area, you know, and, um, I'm really, I feel like I'm in a good place right now. You know, Brian Zond, another person um, that you should listen to has really yeah. been kind of opening my eyes to that. You know, once you, once you start to realize some of this, stuff, especially for a lot of our listeners who the bubble's been burst and they're fine, they're, they're seeing a lot of the stuff that's been hidden under the hidden in the closet in the church, you know, there's this tendency that I think a lot of people feel like, okay, I can't, I just can't have anything to do with any of it. I can't go back to any of it, but I don't, I don't think that's the case. You know, he says in his new book, when everything's on fire, demolition is, is necessary and renovation is necessary and, and do that. You know, if you have to throw a bunch of stuff out, do it, but don't burn it all down. You know, I'm paraphrasing of course, but don't burn it all down. Um, there's, there's something there, you know, so uh, it, I feel good to be able to say that with confidence today, you know, but tomorrow I might feel differently. You know, it's not yeah. about being certain anymore. It's not about feeling good all the time. At a time. Exactly. Exactly. I'm a human. I'm going to be moody and my moods are going to affect my, the way I think about stuff sometimes. And that's okay. It's just part of the experience. Yeah, for sure. Well, Caleb, again, thank you for coming on, being on. I'm glad that people are getting to know you a little more and kind of learning about you. If you're a listener and you want to kind of engage with some more of our content, um, we put, we've been trying to put out more stuff on Instagram. If you want to follow us at uh, Rethinking Christianity Podcast, we're also trying to get, if you are interested in sending in a question um, through the form of audio, uh, we would love to do that and add that as a segment to some of these episodes where we just kind of talk about a question that you ask. Um, and through our Instagram, you'll be able to do that. Or if you want to send us a voice message on Instagram, I believe that we can save them. I'll have to look into that. But uh, we would love to hear your questions and we would love to have your voice on the podcast because you are, uh, this is who, you know, we do the podcast for is you. Uh, so again, thank you all for tuning in. Um, let us know if you have any feedback. If you want to share this episode with somebody that you think would find it helpful, that would be great. Until next time, I am Blake. This is Caleb. And this is Rethinking Christianity. Uh, thank you for, for tuning in. Have a great week.